One evening last week, the whole country here in the UK came together to clap for carers and the National Health Service, or the NHS. For those that don't know, that's the British healthcare system, which is free at the point of access and considered such a national treasure. It was even in our Olympic ceremony, uh, opening ceremony. People came out of their houses and cheered. They banged pans and made loads of noise. It's become a kind of weekly tradition in the UK now, and it's very heartwarming, but I kind of felt like a bit of a fraud that day because I had been on call for heart attacks and we didn't have very many. In fact, it was one of the quietest days at work I've had for weeks. I did treat uh, a couple of patients admitted with major heart attacks, one of whom turned out to have COVID-19, uh, and I posted what I understand is now mandatory for all healthcare workers on social media, a post-PPE selfie, but that's about it. My colleagues on the ward were slammed, so of course I went to help them and I did some procedures uh, and every patient I saw had COVID. But across the country, here, Spain, America, Italy, all the places that have published data, heart attacks appear to have gone out of fashion. Now, cardiovascular disease kills more people worldwide than anything else. About 2,000 people die of it every day in America alone. So are heart attacks happening less? It seems unlikely. In my own unit, I've seen several patients admitted recently with heart attacks, just way too late for me to treat them. You've heard the expression, time is muscle for heart attacks. When an artery supplying the heart blocks, it needs to be unblocked as soon as possible, within hours, to minimize the amount of permanent damage. The complications caused by an untreated heart attack are thankfully quite rare these days, and my generation of cardiologists simply haven't seen them very often. Unlike uh, some of my colleagues who were working in the 80s and 90s before the era of emergency angioplasty became the norm. But this may be changing. Patients are now so scared to come to hospital in fear of catching the virus. Some patients also feel that, oh, I don't want to trouble all those hardworking doctors and nurses who are so busy with other things. Both reactions lead patients to convince themselves their chest pain is actually just indigestion and they don't call an ambulance. 24, 48 hours later, they've become progressively more and more unwell, and when they eventually go to hospital, the damage is done, and there's nothing that I can offer them except tablets. But these are probably the minority. Perhaps we in the hospital are not even hearing about the majority who are suffering their heart attacks in silence at home, and either riding it out, or going on to develop a heart failure later, or simply dying at home. Another explanation is that patients with heart attacks are presenting with COVID complications that are so much more severe that everything else takes a back seat or gets missed entirely. I know I have been promising a video about COVID in the heart for weeks. I'm sorry I haven't made it that yet, but things just keep changing so rapidly, but I promise it, it is coming soon. Some people have proposed that on the whole, um, people are engaging in activities that bring on heart attacks less like rush hour road rage or sporting events. An interesting theory claims that less air pollution has reduced heart attacks. It's all guesswork at the moment. But I would counter those points saying that there's probably enough increased anxiety from fear or loss of income that will precipitate heart attacks to offset any reduction. Of course, this isn't limited to cardiology. All my colleagues are reporting drops in attendances in general surgery, gynecology, oncology, vas vascular surgery. One that is likely to be a true drop is trauma, because road traffic and workplace accidents are probably at their lowest for, for decades. But otherwise, I think that these reduced numbers are a misleading statistic. A paediatric consultant messaged me to say that uh, at least a dozen children in the UK have died in the last week from avoidable non-COVID deaths because they stayed at home too long. More women are opting for free births, i.e. giving birth at home without any assistance, rather than going to hospital, and this is exacerbated by the closure of many birth centers. Chronic or long-standing conditions are the next huge area where patients are being affected. All elective or planned operations have been canceled, so while a cataract operation or a knee replacement isn't life-saving, it is life-changing, and these have been postponed for who knows how long. Some people are going to die waiting for things like a heart bypass or cancer operations. Chemotherapy has been paused on millions of patients because the last thing hospitals want is for the immunosuppressed cancer patients to pick up coronavirus in the hospital. Many countries are now facing a post-mortem or autopsy crisis. 
there simply aren't enough staff to perform post-mortems on all the dead, particularly because mortuaries are overflowing at the moment with COVID positive patients upon whom post-mortems are generally not being performed. Friends in psychiatry are seeing a widespread deterioration in their patients' well-being. This situation is affecting all of our mental health, but people with pre-existing obsessive compulsive and anxiety disorders are really struggling. A friend told me that his patients with paranoid tendencies have been extremely troubled by the conspiracy theories flying around the internet and have markedly deteriorated. He's actually the only member of his staff in his team of nine that is not off sick at the moment. So he's obviously unable to cope and admits that his patients are getting suboptimal care as he desperately tries to do what he can on his own. The bottom line is, to understand this, we need more data, but what form will that data take? To accurately assess these indirect health impacts of COVID-19 will take many months or years, and even then will be very hard to fully understand. To give you some context, we're still not sure about the impact of H1N1. And of course, no matter what course of action is taken against COVID-19, there is no way to avoid a global recession, which will also have a huge health impact, not to mention victims of domestic violence, vulnerable children, the homeless, refugees, the list goes on. But while those have received some coverage in the media, rightfully so, I didn't think the subjects of this video had, and hence why I made it. So I'll just close by saying, that just because COVID is dominating the headlines, it doesn't mean that other medical problems have gone away. Please do not ignore serious symptoms and please do not feel you'll be adding to our workload. This is what we're here for.